yes, thank you, Keely. All right, I'll, I'll introduce you. So um, welcome everyone to the uh, Geophysics and Tectonics Seminar. Um, this week we have um, Antoinette Grima, uh, who's now a postdoc at the University of Texas, Austin. Um, who will be talking about um, orphan slabs, um, where they are, where they've gone. <laughs> uh, and so uh, thank you for joining us, Antoinette, and take it away. Thank you, Keely, and thank you for in inviting me to give this talk. And thank you to everyone who joined us um, today for this um, GNT seminar. Um, so today I'll be talking about some of the work I did during my PhD. And this was in collaboration with Carolina litko Bertoloni and Fabio Cramery. Oh, oh. oops, sorry. Um, okay, so, um, right, so from seismic uh, advances in seismic tomography models in the late, in, in the last couple of decades or so, have revealed to us a mantle that is way more complex than we had ever imagined before. And we can see some of that complexity in this cross-section of a P-wave model from Foucault and Kuku Waters from 2009. And we can see, for example, here the, um, the Japan slab that's being flattened and deflected above 660 kilometers depth. We can also see um, slab material in the lower mantle and all the way down to the core mantle boundary. And we can also see um, these isolated slablets in the uppermost um, lower mantle. But the diversity and complexity of um, slab morphologies in a mantle really hits home with this excellent cartoon from Saskia Goes and Co Waters from 2017. And if we just had to eyeball this, um, figure, we could easily come to the conclusion that there is no rhyme or rhythm to um, slab behaviors and therefore slab morphologies in the mantle. But if we study this cartoon for a little bit longer, we can start to see patterns and we can um, tease out three main categories for slab morphologies. The first um, being um, penetrative slabs. And these are slabs that manage to sink down um, into the lower mantle without too much deflection um, or deformation. On the other side, on the other hand of the spectrum, we have these um, flattened slabs at 660s, uh, at 660. And these are uh, slabs that um, deflect in the mantle transition zone and roughly make up half of the slabs observed in seismic tomography models. And then finally, we also have slabs that are um, fragmented or broken. Um, and these unmembered morphologies have inspired some of the most important questions in geodynamics. For example, the fact that some slabs flatten at some subduction zones, but not others, has inspired both pros and cons um, arguments for the discussion whether we have whole mental convection, for example, or layered convection. Um, and then it also begs the question, why do we have um, penetrative slabs at some subduction zones, but not at others? what is the difference between these subduction zones and these slabs? And what is the link between these morphologies and these other morphologies? Is there a link? Um, and these are important questions that we need to ask and that we need to understand because slabs from seismic tomography have been used to infer things like the mantle viscosity, um, they've been used to calculate, to calculate the geoid, for example, um, and they've also been used to date the age of slab material in the mantle, but also um, to pre-construct um, paleoplate motions. And this is normally done by taking these fragmented slabs and reconstructing them back to the surface. Right, so how is this normally done? Well, 
before we um, get to that, we must first um, assume that each individual slab fragment is um, associated with an individual distinctive um, subduction regime that is independent with that is independent of anything that came before it or after it. So, for example, if we take this red slab over here, um, the initiation, the tip of the slab, would be um, the initiation of that subduction regime, and um, the length of the slab would be uh, could be used as a measure for the duration of the subduction and its associated tectonic regime at the surface, whereas the top of the of the slab, the uppermost part of the slab fragment, would then be correlated to the cessation of that subduction regime. So if we can date the top of the slab, then we can date, uh, we can know when that subduction regime ended. And then once this subduction regime ended through um, slab breakoff, we had reinitiation of subduction and the same trench, and so on and so forth. Um, so with this information, we can go a step further. And what we can do is, we can also reconstruct the paleo trench. And the way to do that is very simple. So what we would need to do is, we would need to take the slab fragment, right? And reconstruct it upwards through the mantle. So um, we'd take the slab fragment and we'd move it up and up and up until it reaches the surface. And at that point where the slab fragment impinges on the surface, that is where we would put um, our paleo trench. And um, from then we can um, reconstruct our paleo plate and then we can reconstruct our paleo plate motions. So this is a very, this is a very nice story, um, but we need to be aware of the assumptions that needs to go into this story. And the first assumption is that trenches are stationary. Now, um, if we look at numerical models, at analog models, but if we also go out in the field and look at, um, at the geology, we can see that trenches do not like to remain stationary. They like to move about. In particular, they like to retreat, although we do have some cases where um, the trench also advances. The other assumption is that um, we have vertical subduction. So what this means is that the slab sinks directly under the trench in a straight vertical line. Um, and again, if we look at our numerical models and our analog models, um, this doesn't seem to be the case. And then if we go and compare this with what we see in seismic tomography, um, we see that in general, the slab tip in seismic tomography models is located hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers away from the surface expression of the trench. The other assumption that goes into the story is that slabs must all break close to the surface, close to the trench. Um, and then once we have this shallow slab breakoff, then subduction must cease. Um, because obviously now we've lost the negative buoyancy that's dragging the slab downwards, and um, that subduction regime has now been shut down. And any new material that will overlie our slab must therefore be a reinitiation of a new subduction regime that has come about from a surface plate reorganization. Um, so this kind of makes us ask the question, um, is this the only interpretation? Um, and is this the only way that we can relate these fragmented slabs with the surface regime? Well, before we can even answer this question, we must think about what causes, what shapes slab morphologies. And at the end of the day, um, the slab morphology is a reflection of the interplay between the buoyancy and strength, right? 
And this relationship is largely controlled by the slab buoyancy and slab strength with respect to that of the surrounding mantle at that depth. And that is shaped by the upper mantle to lower mantle phase transitions um, and their associated clapron slopes, and by the mantle viscosity variations, which um, depend on the dominant deformation mechanism at those pressure and temperature conditions, be this diffusion creep or dislocation creep. Um, so similar to what others have done before us, we study the physics of this relationship using a 2D numerical model of subduction. And we do this with the finite difference, finite volume code and um, stack by Y developed by Pontaki. And what you're currently seeing on the screen right now is our initial model setup. So we have um, a, we have the ringwoodite to richmanite and ferropericlase phase transition, and we have a mental viscosity structure based on the latest um, inversions from Rudolf and co authors from 2015. So we have a low viscosity layer between 660 and 1000 kilometers and an increase in viscosity at 1000 kilometers. So um, an important thing that this cartoon is showing is these um, shades of gray. So um, the darker the shade of gray, the more viscous is our, um, our model at that depth. Okay, so what do our results show? So what I'm showing you here is a regime diagram. And on the y-axis, we have the slab yield stress or the slab strength. And on the x-axis, we have the clapron slope. Um, and what we can see in red diamonds are slabs that flatten and in magenta triangles we have slabs that penetrate into the lower mantle. So what we can see from this regime diagram is that when we have relatively negative clapron slopes combined with relatively weaker slabs, slabs would tend to flatten at 660 kilometers depth. However, when we have uh, relatively stronger slabs and less negative clapron slopes, these slabs will uh, preferentially penetrate into the lower mantle. Um, but what is really interesting in this regime diagram is not so much what you can see, but more what you can't. And what I'm talking about is this white space in between these two end member morphologies. Um, and for the first time, we can fill that space with a new behavior, which we term slab orphaning. Um, slab orphaning is when the slab sinks into the lower mantle penetrates below 660 kilometers depth and breaks directly at the top of the lower mountain. So how does this happen though? Let's have a look and try to understand the orphaning process. Um, so what you can see here in this deformation map is the slab evolution prior to orphaning, during orphaning, and after orphaning, when the slab has split into a separate parent and orphan slab. And now let's zoom in at this point of the model evolution, because this is clearly the most interesting um, snapshot out of the tree. And let's look at the density. So, what you can see here is the formation of a low density lens uh, within the coal slab core. And this is the result of the temperature dependence of the phase boundary depth. So what this means is that 
um, the cold material inside the slab core hasn't yet transitioned into the higher density um, lower mantle phase. So what you end up having is a lens of buoyant material within the slab core that um, resists the subduction of the slab into the lower mantle. However, we must keep in mind that the slab tip is sinking into a low viscosity layer. So the resistance to its sinking is greatly reduced here. And what this means is that the slab is therefore sinking at higher subduction um, velocities. The slab tip has higher sinking velocities. And this creates a slab tip that is therefore in tension. So what we end up having here is a change in the force balance, up dip of the 660 and down dip of the 660. And we have shearing right here, right? So above 660, we have compression. And below 660, we have tension, which is stretching and pulling and shearing the slab down. The other thing that's also happening here is that if we have higher slab sinking velocities, then we also have higher, um, and we also have higher um, strain rates. Now, the thing is, our slab is already at its maximum yield stress. So on one hand, we have increasing um, strain rates. Our stress is constant, and therefore, this means that our viscosity must decrease. And if the viscosity of our slab tip decreases, then this means that we have slab weakening right here. The other thing that we need for orphaning is the, um, is the viscous induced flow. So prior to orphaning, the viscous induced flow has a predominantly vertical component, and this helps to drag the slab into the low viscosity layer. However, um, at this point, we can now note that in the low viscosity layer, the induced viscous flow has a predominantly horizontal component. And what this is doing is it's pushing the slab, the bottom of the slab, or that part of the slab in the low viscosity layer in one direction, which is the opposite sense direction of the flow in the upper mantle. So what we have here is the slab in the upper mantle that's being pushed this way, and the slab tip in the low viscosity layer is being pushed in the opposite direction, right? So this is aiding the shearing that we were talking about before until eventually the slab splits into a separate orphan, into a separate orphan and a separate parent slab. Um, the thing is, is orphaning limited to this one particular slab? Is this um, sort of a one-off behavior? And the answer, again, is given by this regime diagram, where we can clearly see that orphaning can occur for strong slabs, slabs with medium to strong um, strength, but also for weak slabs, provided that this is offset by some um, amount of resistance from the mountain. Um, Right, so how important is the role of the mantle? And how important is the role of the phase transition at 660 kilometers? As you will see here, the answer to that question is it's very important. So I'm going to be showing you the same slab with the same um, slab strength, the same initial conditions, but I'm going to be varying the Clapeyron slope value. So in this case, we have a slab that has a yield stress of 400 MPa, and it's sinking into a mantle with a Clapeyron slope of minus 1.5 megapascals per Kelvin. And as you can see, the slab sinks into the low viscosity layer and all the way into the lower mantle. Keeping the same slab, 
but now changing the Clapeyron slope to a value of minus two uh, megapascals per Kelvin, we can see that the slab also sinks into the lower mantle, into the lower mantle, but it breaks off directly at 660 kilometers depth. And if we again keep the same initial conditions, everything in our model is the same, but this time round we have increased um, the sorry, we have decreased the um, Clapeyron slope to minus 2.5. We can see that in this case, the slab will not be able to penetrate into the low viscosity layer, but instead it will flatten on top of the 660. So what this is showing us really is that the relationship between the slab strength and that of the ambient mantle at depth is extremely important in shaping the slab dynamics and the slab morphology. But how important is this? Um, how, how affected is this relationship by the initial conditions in our model? If we say, for example, I don't know, change the initial subduction angle from our standard 30 degrees to 60 degrees, will that change our slab behavior? And will we still get orphaning? And as we can see, the slab sinks into the lower mantle, it bends, the slab toe is now upturned, but the slab still orphans at 660 kilometers depth. What about um, if we change the overriding plate type, right? Because so far we've always been looking at ocean ocean convergence. What if we now have a continental overriding plate? Will this change our behavior? And as we can see, the slab sinks into the lower mantle, but it still breaks at 660 kilometers depth. It's still orphans. Okay, so for all the examples that I've shown you here, whether I've been talking about different slab strengths or different slab angles or um, different overriding plate types, we have seen a slab that has metamorphosed from a penetrative mode through orphaning to a flattened morphology. So, what is happening here is that as the slab sinks into the lower mantle, it is adjusting to the change in its force balance by switching to a different morphology. And the pathway to that change is orphaning. Um, but is this just an exercise in the regime, in the regime space? Um, do we see orphaning in nature. And a good place to look for orphan slabs are long-lived subduction zones, such as, for example, um, the Farallon or the Tetis. Um, and taking the Tetis as one example, um, let's have a look at the seismic tomography from this region we can see that starting all the way from the Eastern Mediterranean, going through Arabia, through Asia, the present day um, subducting slab is underlain by um, fragmented slabs. Um, and while the current interpretation is one of shallow slab breakoff, change in subduction regime and subduction reinitiation, re what if this meant that what we're seeing is a leftover um, remnant of a slab mode switch, for example? Um, and this is a, an important question to consider when we are looking at seismic tomography models and when we're trying to interpret the surface geology based on what we see in seismic tomography. Um, 
because this has implications for things like the age of the slab material in the mantle, for example. So if we had to consider the usual um, slab dynamics, right, where the slab breaks off at the surface and slowly, slowly sinks to the lower mantle, then that would give us a very different age to um, a dynamic that would um, mean that you had a slab that sank into the mantle, penetrated, orphaned, and then deflected. And this is important, especially when we're trying to time things like um, cessation of subduction, subduction reinitiation, and things like that, um, that go into, that can inform the timing of island arc accretions, for example, which then feed into um, plate tectonic reconstructions, like the one we see below, for example, and where we would place our um, paleo trenches, and then how we would um, position our paleo continents, and then how we would um, model the motions of those um, paleo continents. The other implication that this has is for the viscosity of the mantle. So, what um, these slab fragments have also been used for is to calculate based on their age and um, their sinking speed, the viscosity of the mantle. But again, this will have a different, um, this will have a different result if we consider a simple ploplet sinking vertically downwards through the mantle, uh, as opposed to um, a slab that sinks and interacts with the mantle and um, deflects and flattens as it adjusts to this um, change in buoyancy forces. And the other implication, which is uh, rather important, is the role of the phase transitions and the mantle viscosity structure. So um, generally speaking, when we're trying to understand slab dynamics, we tend to look at things like the subduction angle, the slab strength, um, but we sometimes forget to consider the role of the mantle. And we think of the mantle as this passive thing into which slabs are simply sinking. But as we've seen throughout this presentation, the phase transition and the mantle viscosity structure have a first order impact in shaping the dynamics of the slab and its morphology. So, in conclusion, um, not all slabs need to break close to the surface. Slabs can easily sink down into the lower mantle and break directly at 660 kilometers depth. There is a link between penetrative and flattened morphologies, and that link is orphaning. And orphaning can occur for a wide range of subduction parameters. Um, it can occur for young slabs, um, medium strength, strong slabs, and very strong slabs, therefore very old slabs. Um, and the last point is that we really need to understand the dynamics of these, slab, deep, these deep slabs properly if we want to um, avoid overinterpreting seismic tomography. Um, and that's it. On that note, um, I'll take any questions. I'll applaud for everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I saw we have a hand raised already. Uh, Min Chen, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes. Uh, Antoinette, uh, thank you so much. I'm super excited to see your results uh, because uh, we saw it in our new image beneath East Asia, this uh, slab opening right oh, beneath cool. the uh, I really hope uh, we can talk. Uh, I can even show you guys the image right now because it looks just like what you showed there. Uh, hey, the yeah, it's, it's super exciting. Um, I, I well, we definitely need to talk, but our image is, uh, is exactly what you showed, pretty much. And we want uh, more interpretation. 
Uh, and I do have a question in terms of, uh, for example, you said, uh, okay, if there is a negative uh, clap prone slope, um, you, you tend to have uh, different morphology, right, across the 660 for the slab. So can you elaborate uh, a little bit more? What does that mean? Like a negative clap prone slope means um, like viscosity uh, strong decrease or increase? What does that mean? So, um, okay, so what I was, ref I think you're referring to this, um, to this slide, right? Um, let me find it. Um, oh. um, there you go, this slide, right? Um, so, the, okay, so the slab morphology is not just simply dependent on the effect of the Claparian slope. So it depends also on the slab strength. So it's this interplay between the slab strength and the Claparian slope values. So for example, if we have um, less negative Claparian slope, like the one, minus 1 1.5 over here, but the slab is also relatively weak, we can still see orphaning. If the slab strength is, um, is increased, we can see that then orphaning, we don't have any more orphaning, but the slab simply simply penetrates. So it's this um, sort of interplay between the two, right? You can't just draw a line and um, say, you can't get this morphology um, for weak slabs, for example, or you can't get this morphology for um, very negative Claparin slopes or less negative Claparin slopes. Okay, so the more negative Claparin slope means, uh, okay, so that, that means the viscosity increased more or across the 660? Is that what are you trying to say here? But, uh, oh. How do you have your, like your simulation? That's what I want to, to okay, know. So, that kind okay. of, mm -hmm, parameter will change if there is more negative Claparin so, slope. So the Claparin slope is, um, so in all cases, right, I have a low viscosity layer um, between 660 and 1,000 kilometers depth. So below 660, in all cases, the um, viscosity is decreasing. But the Clapeyron slope is essentially the slope that describes the pressure and temperature dependence of um, the phase transition. So as the as ringwoodite changes to richmondite and ferroferricles. Okay, so so basically, so it's the most the same setup pretty much in all cases. Yeah, okay. yes. So through, through all the models that I've shown, uh -huh. I've always had the same viscosity setup. So I've always had um, a low viscosity layer between six, six and a thousand kilometers, and a viscosity increase at a thousand kilometers depth. Right. Okay. And then the just to make that clear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So the uh, clap on slope uh, changes, like it affects the temperature field in your simulation, right? Pretty much. So um, well, we are using a Bustinesque approximation. So, and I'm not using a Bustinesque approximation. So we do not deal with the latent heat effects of the phase transition, for example. So um, we just input it directly in our model. So essentially what it's doing, it's offering, um, in this case, less or more resistance at 660 kilometers depth. So okay. if it's more negative, there's more resistance. If it's more, less negative, then there's less resistance. I don't want to take uh, more time, but I really have one question to ask. So why do you put this low velocity layer right beneath 660? Uh, is there any other evidence supporting this implementation of your, I mean, your setup? So um, we put a low viscosity layer, um, not a low velocity layer. And oh, no. sorry about that. <laughs> um, and that is based on the geode inversions from uh, Rudolf Vetsal. So they use these um, trans-dimensional, trans-hierarchical Bayesian inversions of the gravity field. And yeah. when you do not um, when you do not prescribe um, the depth of your viscosity increase, what these inversions give you is um, the viscosity increases at a thousand, uh, thousand kilometers depth, but it also gives you the um, layers of your 
the layers of your of your gravity of sorry the, the different layers of your viscosity and um, in this case um, when this is not constrained by um, by putting it at 660 um, it will give you three layers right and as we know from the catalyst parameter for example um, any low any high viscosity um, layer or channel must be um, compensated by a low viscosity um, channel or layer and the viscosity reduction so the gravity field is not sensitive to how um, deep that um, channel is really and truly it just um, this is what the catalyst parameter um, explains right so what is important for the gravity field is the relationship between the thickness of that layer and the um, viscosity decrease across the layer so if you have a, a viscosity layer that is quite thick but then the viscosity increases just of one magnet of one order of magnitude for example that would be exactly the same as having um, a very thin layer with a viscosity contrast that is at uh, two or four orders of magnitude less viscous. So um, that, that is what this um, viscosity structure is based on. So we decided to um, implement um, a relatively thick um, low viscosity layer that only has one order of magnitude viscosity reduction across it, as opposed to having a very thin low viscosity layer with um, three or four orders of magnitude viscosity decrease, viscosity contrast. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, let's talk um, more. And I hope I can get in touch. I mean, we can connect. Yes, yes, of course. Please do get in touch. Thank you. Uh, thank you. You can um, stay on the line if you want afterwards and, and exchange okay. some details. Um, uh, Jeroen Ritzma, would you like to ask your question? I can ask for you. Um, it was about, um, can orphanine occur with a smooth viscosity profile at a thousand kilometers? Um, so do you mean, a vis so you mean like a viscosity, what, what do you mean by a smooth viscosity conscious? Do you mean that the viscosity just keeps on the increasing slowly from um, all the way down to a thousand kilometers? Yeah, so no, no sharp contrast. So no, I assume no, in that sense, the viscosity jump you have. So you have that low viscosity layer. Yeah. So I assume if it was more of a gradual transition than like a jump backwards and forwards. Uh, well, so in this case, okay, so if you have to remove the sharp jump, then you wouldn't have a low viscosity channel, right? Because you just, I mean, what you have is, uh, an upper amount of viscosity, then a decrease in viscosity, then an increase in viscosity. So, and this is just this is just one order of magnitude um, less viscous than the mantle above it. So it's not that sharp. Um, if we had to remove the low viscosity layer and just have um, a gradual increase of the viscosity up until a thousand kilometers, and then an increase, like the viscosity keeps increasing from one thousand kilometers downwards then no you do not you don't see orphaning so you need a low viscosity layer um at some depth um before you for you to see orphaning i hope that answers the question um hopefully uh you if you want to yeah okay that sort of covers it um kent condy you had a question would you like to ask it yeah, I'm interested in this orphaning as you go back in geologic time, and especially back when the mantle was considerably hotter in the Archean. Looking at your strength versus Clapeyron slope diagram, I was wondering if orphaning would be more or less uh, important as you get back when the mantle was hotter. Clearly, the slab strength would go down on the vertical axis, but what happens to the Clapeyron slope? Now, the Clapeyron slope is dependent upon what? I guess the hydration of the slab is one thing. Um, is there anything else that Clapeyron slope is dependent upon? And how would both of these interplay with each other as you go back into the Archean? Uh, 
Um, that is a really interesting question. Um, I haven't thought all the way back to the again. <laughs> yeah, just go yeah. back in the mantle's hotter, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the Clapeyron slope depends on the pressure and temperature, right? So presumably um, the phase transitions would occur at shallower depths, maybe? Uh, I'm not sure. I need to think about that more. But yeah, that is a good question. Um, but also some people have said that going back in time, right, the slabs are also thicker. Um, because you'd have this sort of thickening uh, at the surface. Um, yeah, the, so, well, the, the solidest, the intersection of the adiabat with the solids is, is deeper, so they would be thicker. Yeah. But they'd still be uh, less strong, they'd be weaker, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, it is, it's, it's something that definitely need to think about a little bit more. Um, maybe you'd have more orphaning and maybe it would be um, at around slightly shallower depths, maybe? So the variable there is your, your clapper on slope is becoming more negative. Why would it become more negative as you go back? Um, Um, not necessarily that it's becoming more negative, right? That um, what I'm thinking of is that maybe the phase transition would occur um, at shallower depths in the mountain, maybe. I'm not sure if, if yeah, something that I need to think about for sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, in interesting thought there. Uh, Yuri Tamama, are you, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Um, thank you so much for your interesting presentation. I was just wondering, out of curiosity, if it was possible for a, the part of the orphan slab that broke off to maybe have melted in the mantle, leaving just the flattened part and making it look like it was just flattened as opposed to being orphaned? Hmm. Uh... Well, it takes quite a long time for slab material to become assimilated within the mantle, right? Like something like, what, 300 million years? Um, so maybe, yes, for, for, older, for older slabs, right, that would have orphaned um, before, maybe. Um, but not for the, not for the, sort of slab fragments that we see in the, in the uppermost lower mountain. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Ichin had a question in the chat uh, about why the mantle below 660, 660 has lower viscosities um, and what's the cause of the viscosity reduction. So you sort of, I guess, stated why you were using it, um, but yeah, are there any theories as to why they think there might be a viscosity reduction there? Um, so yeah, so that's just based, so that's based on the on the geoid inversions, right? So um, like I said before, if you do not um, constrain the viscosity increase to happen at 660 kilometers depth, and there's no reason for it to happen at 660 kilometers depth, apart from um, you know the fact that some slabs stagnate at 660 kilometers depth. And then the geoid inversions would want the viscosity increase to happen at a thousand kilometers depth, uh, 1,200 kilometers depth, around about that, that depth in the mantle. And this is not something that, um, you know, is that groundbreaking. Like King and Masters also had a paper in 1992, I want to say, um, also talking about this. And there were some papers in the 90s as well um, by Kido et al. that have also sort of done this joint inversion and seen the viscosity increase um, at a thousand kilometers depth. Um, the presence of the low viscosity channel is something that is required by the geoid. So if you have a viscosity increase, then this must be compensated by um, 
a, a lower um, viscosity. And if you constrain this jump to occur at 660, and therefore you only have two layers, then this is satisfied by having a lower viscosity upper mantle. But if you do not constrain the number of layers, like they do in the Rudolf et al, and you end up having three layers, then you must have a low viscosity channel um, somewhere. And that would have to be preceding the viscosity increase of the, of the lower mantle. So that is why it is there. It's, it's something that is required by the geoid inversions. Um, others, so the reason why um, physically it exists, so some people have suggested, um, you know, um, a hydration of the, the entire like, um, upper mantle transition, sorry, the upper to lower mantle transition zone and um, some um, the top of the lower mantle as well. Um, but it's not entirely clear why um, physically it, 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 it exists or, or yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for answering that. Um, you can add to the chat uh, if you want more follow-up. Um, Kent, I think we covered your question about the clapper on show. Um, is Sean Wei, would you like to ask your question? Sean? Uh, yeah. Right. Um, so next talk, um, here I, I also have a question about clapper on slope is, uh, I, I'm a seismologist, but my understanding is in recent maybe 10 years from lab experiments and also like first principle calculations, looks like the, the clapper on slope for 660 becomes kind of flat. I mean, the, the slope is closer to zero compared to what we thought maybe 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, you, you probably know like uh, Lars and Carolina's calculations. So in that sense, basically you, we are moving, uh, we are shifting towards the right side of your chart now. Uh, does that mean most slabs penetrate into the lower mantle? And in that sense, there's no often slabs? Um, so, yep. Yeah. So, actually, um, some recently published um, papers from 2019 and earlier this year, um, based on lab experiments, actually think that the actually show that the Clapeyron slope um, is probably more around minus two. Um, if you consider all of the, um, the multi-mineralic components that make up the slab and the mantle. So if we have a Clapeyron slope of minus two, actually, you can get all three behaviors. You can get flattening, you can get orphaning, and you can get um, penetration depending on the slab strength or the slab age. So if you have very old slabs or very strong slabs, they will penetrate. Um, if you have medium sort of old slabs, then they will orphan. And if you have very young slabs, then they will flatten if we take this um, Clapeyron slope value. But what this regime diagram is showing you um, really is that orphaning is not tied to one specific Clapeyron slope, right? You can get orphaning all the way from minus 2.5 to minus 1.5. Thank you. Um, uh, I see uh, uh, each and had sort of uh, another question in the chat, if you want to look at um, internet. Um, the slab strength is set to um, 400 megapascals. Uh, which seems maybe a little too large than expected. Um, so the question was, do you see any slab folding above the 660? Uh, wait, what was the question? Sorry, I can't find uh, it in the chat. Uh, so many. <laughs> your, your slab strength, so for the examples that you showed uh, where you had the same um, slab strength, 400 megapascals, and then you changed a variety of other parameters to show you could always get orphaning, um, the question was that seems like a strong slab, maybe an overly strong slab, um, and so do you see slab folding, I guess, if you're using a weaker slab um, above um, in any of these models? Okay, so um, can you see the slab here um, at the bottom 
uh, left, right? Uh, well, the bottommost um, figure. So this is a this is the weakest slab that uh, we have in our in our models, and you can see that the slab um, is very much folded and deformed. Um, we have tried actually with slabs that were weaker than 200 megapascals. We've tried 100, and the slab behavior is very strange. It just kind of like drips, which is not what we uh, observe in seismic tomography models. Um, so it seems like the maximum sort of, well, the minimum, I should say, um, slab um, strength that we can have is 200 megapascals. Actually, um, 400 megapascals is not that overly strong. Um, so there are lab experiments that um, show that you could have like um, 500, 600, 700 megapascals. Um, but I am not a rock mechanics person, so. Neither am I, so thank you. Um, uh, Jackie Lee, would you like to ask your question? Thank you for the talk. Uh, I also noticed that around the full turn, there seems to be a viscosity reduction inside the cell, making the cell seems to be teared apart or something. I wonder what is the cause for that? Is this caused by the phase transition from olivine to vaselite or something else? Thank you. Um, no, um, no. So we do not have the we do not have the four ten, and the reason why we don't have it is because um, previous studies um, show that the 410 does not um, really affect um, slab dynamics all that much. What um, I think you are referring to is this um, viscosity reduction over there, and that is just a melting viscosity reduction. That's um, essentially just our asthenosphere, and it does not extend all the way to 410. Um, so the 410 would be somewhere around, around somewhere around there. My, my laser is a bit too wide. Um, so yeah, so. Yeah, but if you move the uh, mass to the slab around the photon, it seems that the, the viscosity is a little low. The color. Oh, you mean, you mean here around the slab uh, body? Uh, yeah, inside the slab. Mm. Uh, somewhere around here, around the around the slab itself, right? Uh, maybe it is uh, just uh, at the slab's position inside the slab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Okay. Um. So yes. So no, that is not not because of the four ten. Like I said, we do not have the four ten in our models. This is just um the reduction of the viscosity due to increased um stress in the mantle due to the subduction of the slab. So as the stress increases, then the viscosity um, decreases and you have the activation of um, dislocation creep here. And that's why the viscosity is reduced. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Dan Frost, would you like to ask your question? Hi. Um, Hi. So is it the, um, you've only shown us the simulations for new slabs, um, slabs that uh, impinge on the 660 for the first time. Is that the only time that orphaning is possible or can slabs reorphan again? And if they were to tear shallower in the mantle, could they reorphan? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, let me find, let me find the right slide. <laughs> Um, oh, oh dear. Okay. Um, and here I just have to change my pointer because it won't let me. Okay. So, um, okay. So we've seen the first, oh, we've seen the first orphaning, right? And then I'm going to speed it up a little bit because it takes forever, but eventually we can see a second um, um, sinking into the lower mantle, and then that will eventually orphan. Mm. 
So it looks like that happens when the slab uh, morphology changes, when the slab becomes steep. Yes, yes. So I guess you would need to have another sort of change in the force balance again, and then the slab adjusts to that by um, transitioning from these different modes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, we have one other question from Daniel Portner. Would you like to ask your question? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so there, you show your uh, your your uh, regime diagram where where there's both changes in the in the Clapeyron slope and in the slab strength. But is uh, my my understanding is that the Clapeyron slope is a is a fixed parameter. Um, we may not. I, I don't know how well the constraints are and what that number is. But can that change around the globe? And if if not, and are variations that we see in the slab morphology dependent on variable Clapeyron slope, or is that just can that be an indicator for variations in slab strength around the world? Okay, and um, so I guess the short answer is um, we don't really know exactly um, mm. the value of the Clapeyron slope. Um, so people tend to explore values from say minus three to um, zero, for example. Um, but the Clapeyron slope would not um, change drastically like across the globe, um, but it might change um, a little bit based on the kind of mineralic composition that, uh, that you have in the slab, right? But it won't change from um, like minus 0 0.5 to minus 3, right? If that makes sense. Um, but the reason why we explored these different Clapeyron slopes was first and foremost to see sort of if orphaning is tied to a specific kind of um, balance between slab strength and mantle strength one and two we wanted to see uh we wanted to explore what other geodynamic models also explore uh, which are ranges of minus 2.5 to um minus 1 minus 0 0.5 and to see if we despite this variation we still get orphaning so whatever um the clapeyron slope turns out to be um within these ranges that we think are reasonable uh, you should still get orphaning um, and, well, so I guess I guess that what I'm getting at is 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 one of these columns within your regime diagram more how we should approach thinking about the Earth, or should we be thinking about the Earth in terms of this the entirety of this regime diagram? So I think that would be this column, uh, the minus two point, the minus two. Okay. Uh, thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Are there any other questions? In which case, I'm just going to ask one before we end, which is, so it looks like from this that you can basically get orphaning slabs um, in all of the cases. So um, does that mean that I might eventually always orphan or will it really um, just change because we're kind of hanging out in this column of uh, minus two for the Clapeyron slope? What do you mean? You, you sort of tested a number of, of different parameters for a given slab strength and you could basically always end up getting orphaning. So what I'm wondering is, um, given that you can also get orphaning at a variety of um, slab strength, is this inevitable? Will that sort of, if you let the slab get old and strong enough, will it sort of eventually orphan always? Or should we be seeing this more often than I guess maybe we have, is what I'm wondering. Uh Yes, yes, but then there is a then there's a limit, right? Like if the slab is too strong, then it will not orphan. It will just like we see, for example, um, here, right? If the slab is too strong and the resistance, so essentially it's not it's not just the the slab strength, but also like how much resistance you're getting from the mantle. So if the slab strength can overcome that resistance. And penetrate into the into the lower mantle, then you're not going to get orphaning. You're going to get penetration, for example. Right. Okay. 
Um, well, thank you very much. Um, if there are no other questions, then let's thank Antonia again for a great talk. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. If you'd like to stick around and chat, you can.